Hello, Bio 104 students. Today in lecture seven, we're going to be covering the early evolution of life. And here are the topics that we'll be covering in this lecture, and I will recapitulate uh, these topics at the end of the lecture. Here is a list of new vocabulary and uh, noting that bacteria, archaea, and eukarya were part of the new vocabulary uh, for the previous lecture as well. So we ended uh, the previous lecture with the phylogenetic insight that the traditional classification of eukaryotes and prokaryotes is not reflected in their phylogeny. So uh, back about 45 years or so, uh, Carl Woese, uh, utilizing ribosomal RNA sequences, uh, had two really important insights. First, that there was a third domain of life. There was the archaea. And archaea or prokaryotes are, are like bacteria. Bacteria are prokaryotes. Uh, however, archaea and eukarya uh, share common ancestry uh, relative to bacteria. So this insight, uh, really important that prokaryotes or par are paraphyletic. Now, <clears throat> in the previous lecture, uh, well, the lecture, uh, we talked about uh, trace fossil evidence that deep sea thermal vents might have provided uh, some of the initial uh, regions for the origin of life on Earth. And uh, this is a very compelling thought uh, or, or set of ideas that we could look at uh, deep uh, sea hydrothermal vents and asking if they provide insight into early earth conditions. So these vents are where you have uh, magna flow uh, coming up through the earth and this force venting produces uh, water at a really high temperature. And uh, particularly these black smokers are uh, producing, um, inputting a lot of compounds uh, into the surrounding water, uh, including iron, uh, methane, and hydrogen sulfide. Now, what's interesting is that there's a whole food web around these vents. And given that uh, there's essentially no photosynthetic organisms, it really uh, presents this really interesting question as to who are the primary producers in this uh, ecosystem. So often associated with these deep sea hydrothermal vents are these giant tube worms, they're annelids, so they're uh, phylogenetically in the same clade as uh, the common earthworm. And uh, you see these uh, tube worms have these uh, fan-like structures that are red in color, and the red part contains uh, hemoglobins. And what these hemoglobins do is they are transferring hydrogen sulfide uh, to symbiotic bacteria living within uh, these animals. So uh, chemoautotrophic bacteria in archaea are essentially uh, providing, filling in the role of primary producers that we see in most other ecosystems being provided uh, by uh, photosynthetic organisms as in most terrestrial ecosystems, that would be plants. Now, what I'm trying to show you here is basically the, these are all of the possible metabolic pathways that life currently has on Earth. And the point here is if we look at what animals do and we look at what plants do, we see that bacteria and archaea essentially do everything else, all right? And we have bacteria and archaea in these extreme environments characterized by hydrogen, sulfur, iron, nitrogen, carbon monoxide uh, that also have carbon monoxide oxidating bacteria. So relative to the diversity of metabolic systems on earth, bacteria and archaea do everything, whereas plants and animals do just a subset of the range of metabolic uh, forms of different forms of metabolism. Okay, so let's take a quick look at bacteria. Uh, bacteria uh, obviously are really diverse and uh, they form uh, uh, important basis for a lot of ecosystems. 
uh, really interesting research that's emerged in the latter part of the 20th century into the 21st century is this idea of biofilms where bacteria uh, living on surfaces in extracellular matrices. And these biofilms uh, can contain multiple species of bacteria. And then also uh, really uh, interesting research emerging, the concept of thinking or, or thinking about the, the diversity and community of bacteria that live on or the inside of other things, that is the microbiome. And uh, essentially all animals, including ha humans, uh, have an important and very diverse microbiome. All right, now we're coming to a really important part of this lecture and an important part in terms of understanding the early evolution of life on Earth. And that is cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria are thought to be among the oldest organisms alive on Earth that have been quietly absorbing uh, CO2, uh, photosynthesizing, and thence, uh, hence uh, producing uh, sugars and oxygen for the past three and a half billion years. And we think of plants as being photosynthetic organisms, indeed they are, but photosynthesis was actually invented by bacteria. And all of the photosynthetic organisms that we're going to engage with in this course, indeed all of the ones on, on Earth today, essentially have borrowed the machinery of photosynthesis that was invented by cyanobacteria. Now, cyanobacteria, uh, some of them form uh, these structures, uh, stromatolites, which provide some of the uh, earliest evidence for life on Earth, not the earliest, but among the earliest. And these are big structures. So basically, stromatolites are these mats of cyanobacteria to where sediments are accumulating. And basically, they're uh, creating these rock formations through the action of their biofilm and their photosynthetic activity, OK? And so here are, uh, here's a, a bunch of stromatolites growing in a uh, shark bay of Western Australia. And here is a Precambrian, that is meaning that this is pre Phenerozoic. So I encourage you all to go see Lecture 4B, a very short lecture on the fossil record. So this is a time before there's uh, a degree of complex organisms in the fossil record. So there's evidence for these, um, for cyanobacteria photosynthetic organisms dating back to 3.2 to 3.4 billion years. It's a long time. So stromatolites are important. They pro they're, they're an interesting insight into uh, ecosystems that cyanobacteria can form, but they're providing really hard, uh, no pun intended, rock solid evidence for uh, cyanobacteria photosynthetic activity dating back to about three and a half billion years ago. Okay, now we also see the signature of this photosynthetic activity in the oxygenation of the planet. So if we look at the percent oxygen in the atmosphere going through time, so here we are uh, somewhere the origin of the earth here about four and a half billion years ago. We're coming to the first life somewhere probably about 3.9 to 4 billion years ago. And you could see the atmosphere of Earth essentially has no oxygen. Then with the appearance of the first photosynthetic bacteria, what we see then afterwards is evidence for the first aerobic bacteria, that is bacteria that are using oxygen. Later after that, we have the first eukaryotes and first multicellular eukaryotes. But this photosynthetic activity provides a dramatic spark of oxygenation of the Earth. And here we see then the evolution of the first chordates. That's the clade we are in as vertebrates. Uh, the terrestrialization of life. And you see oxygen uh, levels reach a peak at about 255 million years ago or so. And this is where we have giant flying insects because the earth was essentially saturated. The atmosphere was saturated with oxygen. 
And as we learn about insects, uh, uh, respiration and how they're getting oxygen is very different from uh, vertebrate animals and would be size limited. This is why we don't see a lot of really large insects today is because oxygen levels are not what they were at a time when in, we had uh, the largest insects um, ever in the history of that clade. So the point here is that through photosynthetic activity, it actually uh, resulted in a dramatic change of the atmospheric content of Earth. And this becomes you know, rather uh, straightforward to understand when we think about what photosynthesis is doing, right? So we're starting with uh, six uh, uh, carbon dioxide molecules, six water molecules, adding light, and we're getting sugars, uh, and six ox oxygen molecules. So for every CO2 molecule, you're making um, an oxygen molecule, an O2 molecule. Now, this pumping of oxygen into uh, the oceans and the atmosphere led to what's called the rusting of the planet uh, about two to 2.8 billion years ago. And this oxygenation of the earth led to several what are called snowball events where it's thought uh, the uh, global temperature on earth really basically got very cold and much of the earth was thought to be glaciated in several time periods dating about 715 to about 635 million years ago. Okay, so this rusting of the planet, uh, what happened was as the photosynthetic uh, cyanobacteria were producing these oxygen molecules, uh, particularly in the ocean, the oxygen dissolved with iron in the oceans and formed these massive rock deposits that are called banded, banded uh, iron formations. So basically, we see the results of the oxygenation of planet Earth through the formation of these banded uh, formations where basically the iron in the oceans uh, was rusted out. Okay, so let's move on to the archaea. Now, the archaea live in many extreme environments, so they're often referred to as extremophiles. So here's an archaea found in deep ocean hydrothermal vents, thriving on volcanic sulfur, and, uh, and, and um, surviving in water temperatures approaching that of boiling, 98 degrees centigrade. Uh, there's also halophiles, where they, uh, these archaea live in uh, conditions of extreme salinity. And uh, ar ar archaea are often found in hot springs. Uh, often in sulfur-rich environments. So the archaea are the organisms we're finding in these extreme environments. So here we have the hot springs of Yellowstone uh, National Park with these archaeal uh, mats here. And you could see the action of these halophiles. Uh, if you've ever flown in and out of San Francisco, you'll see these evaporating ponds in San Francisco Bay. And the color here, this red and orange color, is uh, the action. It, this is the color pigments produced by these archaeal uh, that are living in these extreme saline environments. OK, now with the eukaryotes, so we're, we're in a way, we're marching our way across the tree of life on Earth. Uh, but before we get to the eukaryotes, uh, to throw a, another phylogenetic curveball at you, is when we look at the phylogenetic diversity of, of archaea and eukaryotes, uh, what we see is that there are lineages of archaea that are more closely related to eukaryotes than they are to other archaea. So we were saying that indeed prokaryotes are paraphyletic because you have archaea more closely related to eukaryotes than either is to bacteria. Of course, archaea and bacteria both being prokaryotes. But even in the traditional sense that is defined by Carl Woese's work in the mid to late 1970s, archaea is paraphyletic. 
We have archaea that are more closely related to eukaryotes than they are to other archaea. Now, this has led to some important insights with regard to the origin of eukaryotes. Um, and we'll get to that in a moment. But first, I want to show you some of the fossil evidence uh, for eukaryotes. There's a uh, trace fossil evidence for evolution on land uh, about a billion years ago, eukaryotic evolution on land about a billion years ago, at least origin. There's some trace fossils that uh, point to eukaryotes being present at eight, about 850 to 950 million years ago. But some of the best fossil trace evidence is from the Dushantu formation in China. And this is about 590 million years ago. And uh, this is all pre-Phanerozoic. So the Phanerozoic that, that set, you know, going back from about 541 million years to the present day, uh, where we have complicated life in the fossil record. So this is right before the Phanerozoic, this Dushantu formation. And Dushantu formation is gonna come up again in this lecture. Okay, now the evolution of eukaryotes involve two endosymbiotic events with bacterial lineages, all right? So the origin of the mitochondria in eukaryotes uh, resulted from a lateral transfer of a proteobacteria cell into a early eukaryote cell, all right? Then the origin of the chloroplast resulted from lateral transfer of a cyanobacteria to a eukaryote cell. So when we talked about cyanobacteria inventing photosynthesis, in a sense, photosynthesis has not evolved multiple times, meaning that the basic machinery of photosynthesis is as it was designed and evolved in cyanobacteria. However, by through the lateral transfer of these cells into eukaryote cells, this is the origin of photosynthesis in eukaryotes. And indeed, the origin of mitochondria in eukaryotes is a lateral transfer of a proteobacteria cell into a eukaryote cell. So we're just showing on the phylogeny. Here we have the bacteria. Here we have eukaryotes and the archaea. Of course, archaea would be paraphyletic. There are lineages that are more closely related to eukaryotes that are not represented in this phylogeny. And the green dashed line showing the lateral transfer of a cyanobacterial cell leading to the chloroplast and a proteobacteria cell uh, leading to the origin of the mitochondrion. Now, some of the bacterial uh, evidence or some of the evidence of these bacterial origins of these two um, uh, organelles is that both of them, the mitochondria and the chloroplast, retain a small circular genome uh, that is indicative of their uh, ultimate bacterial origins. So in your body, you technically have two genomes. You have your uh, nuclear genome, uh, so the autosomal genome and the uh, two sex chromosomes, uh, but you also have a mitochondrial genome. It's a small circular genome, it contains 13 protein coding genes, two ribosomal RNAs, and a bunch of transfer RNAs, and uh, a non-translated region called the control region. And your mitochondrial genome is inherited from your mother matrial lineage. So we all have our mom's mitochondria, which was our maternal grandmother, maternal great-grandmother, so on and so forth. Okay, now, there are several events that are important to the evolution of the eukaryotic cell. And one uh, has to lose, lose the protective uh, cell wall. So we have an origin of a flexible surface. We have to uh, infold the membranes and create a surface, greater surface volume without increasing the cell volume. Uh, also needed an origin of a complex cytoskeleton. And in particular, we'll talk about this one particular model about the origin of a nuclear envelope, which encloses the genome and organizes the genome into chromosomes. And the evolution of endocytosis, digestive vacuoles, lysozymes, 
And the endosymbiotic portion, that is the acquisition of mitochondria, and in some lineages, chloroplasts via endosymbiosis. Now, all eukaryotes have a mitochondrion, but not all eukaryotes have a chloroplast. Now, many of these other aspects are not involved with the endosymbiotic aspect of eukaryotic evolution. In eukaryotes, there had to be the formation of the, well, there had to be the losing of the protective uh, cell wall, infolding of cell membranes, and the formation of a nuclear envelope. Those are not associated with endosymbiosis, right? So these are separate sets of events in the origin of the eukaryotic cell, right? All right. So the standard model for thinking about those aspects of the eukaryotic cell that do not involve the endosymbiosis of that result of the mitochondrial chloroplast, a standard model is one that's called the outside-in model. Uh, for the sake of time, we won't be able to talk about the inside-out model, which is a model that's been proposed uh, over the last 10 years or so, more like eight, six to eight years ago. So we could ask, what were the first organisms in which a nucleus evolved? So we're talking about the aspect of the eukaryotic cell that's a nucleus in the organization of the genome, not about the organelles of the mitochondria or the chloroplast. So as I said, they had to lack cell wall. Uh, they had to have a cytoskeleton with actin-like proteins. They had to have DNA with introns, that is uh, breaks within protein coding genes. Uh, they need histone-like proteins to uh, organize the genome and protect the DNA, and had to have membranes with steroid receptors. Now, we talk about, when we talk about endosymbiosis, we're talking about the origin of the mitochondria and chloroplast. And these were events where these uptake of the proteobacteria and the chloroplast, or uh, sorry, cyanobacteria, happened billions of years ago. And these were separate bacterial lineages that were involved. And this happened in a lineage that by this time had evolved a nucleus, all right? So this process of the uptake of these bacterial cells is called endosymbiosis. Now let's look at some definitive evidence for endosymbiosis. Now this is a pretty cool result. Essentially all organisms have ribosomal RNAs. Ribosomal RNAs are transcribed, but they're not translated. And ribosomal RNAs are involved with holding together the uh, ribosomes that are uh, involved with uh, DNA translation, right? Translation of RNA. So mitochondria is thought to have been engulfed only once early in the history of eukaryotes. And uh, there's evidence that uh, the endosymbiote was an alpha proteobacterium, the particular lineage of bacteria. But check this out. So here is a phylogeny inferred from ribosomal RNA DNA sequences. Now this phylogeny is unrooted, although you can see here is uh, a place where the root would be placed. So if we put, put the root here and pull down, archaea, eukaryotes or sister taxa, and here are the bacteria. So if you take the ribosomal RNA from a cell of a human, so the nuclear genome ribosomal RNA, sure enough, the human falls out in eukaryotes, okay? If you take the ribosomal RNA from the mitochondrial genome of that same person, the mitochondrial ribosomal RNA falls out with the bacteria and indeed closely related to the proteobacteria. So in our organelle, the mitochondria, we are carrying the genetic ancestry of the bacterial origin of the mitochondria. I mean, how cool is that? And you can see this in this phylogenetic analysis 
that the ribosomal RNA sequence from the same individual person, its nuclear genome copy falls out just where it should with other eukaryotes, but its mitochondrial copy falls out well nested within bacteria. Now, in this proteobacteria, interestingly enough, there are many other endosymbionts and endopathogens. So, Rickettsia, Rickettsia, that is uh, what causes Lyme disease, is in this group of bacteria. And there are endosymbiote bacteria that are associated with uh, plants in performing nitrogen fixation. So, it seems that having some interaction, uh, symbiotic interaction, endosymbiotic interaction with eukaryotes is something that characterizes this entire clade of bacteria. Okay, let's do the same exercise for uh, the ribosomal RNA from the nuclear genome and the chloroplast genome of a corn uh, plant. So let's go and we sequence its ribosomal RNA from the nuclear genome and indeed the corn uh, gene copy falls out in the phylogeny with the eukaryotes and the chloroplast copy falls out right where we would expect the bacterial phylogeny within, phylogenetically nested within the clade that contains cyanobacteria. All right. Just when we thought it would have been easy to understand endosymbiosis, indeed evolution throws us another curveball. So this is the concept of secondary endosymbiosis, where there's been uptake of a chloroplast containing eukaryotic cell by another eukaryotic cell. Now, this has happened multiple times in the history of eukaryotes. And this is what explains the full distribution of photosynthesis among living eukaryotic lineages, all right? Let's go through this again. Primary endosymbiosis is what we have been talking about up to this point, where we have an early eukaryotic cell with a fully formed nuclear uh, envelope and infolded membranes uptaking a cyanobacteria, they get along really well. By the way, this thing would have, would have also had a mitochondria by this point. And now we have a eukaryotic cell with a chloroplast. And it is doing quite well because it is an autotroph. It's able essentially to make its own food using only carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight, right? A great invention, probably the most important invention in the history of life has been um, photosynthesis by chloroplast. However, here is this eukaryotic cell, you know, living its jam, doing its life quite nicely. And then another eukaryotic cell comes along and says, er, and engulfs it. And now it's engulfing a chloroplast containing eukaryote, our friend from over here. And then you have essentially a, another eukaryotic lineage that has acquired photosynthesis, all right? And it's a secondary endosymbiosis is, why, is what ultimately explains the diversity and distribution of symbiosis that we see among living eukaryotic lineages. So here is the primary endosymbiosis in this diagram. Uh, and over the course of evolution, uh, the cyanobacteria looks a lot, uh, becomes, looks a lot less looking uh, cyanobacteria-like, becomes organelle-like. Then it happens once in red algae, okay? So we have a secondary endosymbiosis once in red algae. So we have a red algae that basically becomes a secondary endosymbiote. That leads to the photosynthesis we see in dinoflagellates, apicomplexins, and uh, stromenophiles, stromenopiles, excuse me. Then it happens in 
at least twice in, with green algae. So we have a green algae that's living life, doing well, secondary endosymbiote, and then we have euglenids, which you might have seen in your high school biology class, as well as a lineage that ultimately will give rise to land plants, okay? So it's happened once in red algae, and it's happened at least twice in green algae. So at least three different secondary endosymbiotic events have happened that this is what explains the diversity of photosynthetic uh, lineages uh, among eukaryotes. Okay. Now we talked about the uh, impact of increased oxygenation. So now everyone, not everyone, but a lot of different lineages are performing photosynthesis. And so oxygen levels are going way up. And what happens in addition to the rusting of the planet, this oxygen is reacting with methane and lowers the greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, all right? So basically CO2 is, uh, levels are going down because of the photosynthesis, but also because of rock weathering. And this is thought to have started a runaway cooling process that resulted in multiple global wide glaciation events, creations of the snowball earth. And these snowball earths were happening at a time of this rapid increase of oxygen. You could see starting at about a billion years ago, we get a rapid growth of oxygen about a billion years ago. And these are where these several multiple snowball earth events were thought to have happened. So these ice ages may have nearly uh, covered, covered the entire earth with glaciers. These deep freezes would have lasted for m millions of years and then would have been interrupted and ended by abrupt periods of warming. So the fluctuations from these ice, these global ice ages to these warm periods may have nearly wiped out life, but also people are arguing could have provided uh, the basis and the, in a sense, ecological opportunities uh, for the evolution of multicellular eukaryotes. All right, now the eukaryotes that we've been talking about up to now have been unicellular. So let's take a look at what the diversity of eukaryotes looks like. So here's a phylogeny of the living lineages of eukaryotes. So I'll just point out, uh, here we are, the animals. And uh, in our next lectures, we'll be talking about the coanoflagellates, uh, sister lineage to animals, the fungi, and the plants. Now, these represent the multicellular lineages of eukaryotes. So it's clear, well, it's inferred that the common ancestor of eukaryotes was unicellular. And if we look at these living lineages of eukaryotes, you can see just counting the major lineages that most of them are unicellular. That's what I'm meaning with this arrow here. This is indicating the major lineages that are unicellular. Most eukaryote lineages are unicellular. The common ancestor, the ancestral state, the most recent common ancestor of eukaryotes was likely unicellular very strong confidence in that hypothesis that it was unicellular. And we're showing this on the geologic time scale. So remember, go back and take a look at lecture 4B. It's very short on the fossil record. So the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic are what comprise the Phanerozoic. The Phanerozoic is where we're seeing complicated organisms in the fossil record. Everything before that is called the Precambrian, except the, the uh, latter part of the Precambrian called the Ediacaran, and we'll talk about that um, briefly. Now, I just want to show you uh, some of the diversity of some of these unicellular uh, eukaryotes, uh, dinoflagellates, uh, diatoms. Diatoms are extremely uh, important in ocean ecosystems and uh, provide the basis for a lot of our understanding of climate or our ability for climate reconstruction because diatoms have glass shells. So they're actually capturing oxygen 
uh, isotopes that were present in oceans at the time they were alive. And uh, they don't uh, technically fossilize. Their, their shells are not organic, they're not, their shells are not replaced with minerals. So uh, one could go uh, get these diatom shells from cores and um, analyze the oxygen isotopes uh, present in them. And then the excavates uh, are interesting unicellular um, eukaryotes, many of which are uh, parasitic um, and uh, pathogenic of, in, in humans. So trichomonas uh, vaginalis, as well as giardia, uh, what you, which you can get from a uh, digestive uh, ailment, which you can get from uh, drinking uh, uh, tainted water. Now, we know that uh, the unicellularity was likely the ancestral state, but looking at the distribution of multicellularity on a uh, phylogeny of the major lineages of eukaryotes, here marking this on the right, we could see that uh, it's clear that multicellularity uh, has multiple origins in among living eukaryotes. Okay, so this is a lecture about early life. And so the question I wanna pose is where do we start seeing fossil evidence of multicellularity? So again, on the time scale down here, the Proterozoic, this is essentially the Precambrian. And what we see are these fossils, uh, which I mentioned earlier that we would return to, the Doshantu, Doshantu fossil formation in China where these microscopic fossils are providing re remains of a really, really tiny two and four eight-celled uh, stages of multicellular organisms. And then right prior to uh, the, the Phanerozoic and the, the Cambrian, uh, the earliest part of that Phanerozoic, uh, where in the Cambrian we start seeing complicated organisms uh, essentially all of the major lineages of animals we can think of, uh, arthropods, mollusks, et cetera, uh, even chordates that vertebrates fall into, we find in the Cambrian, okay? So the story is essentially, it's almost kind of, as I'm going to explain with other groups of organisms, it is a whoop there it is uh, mechanism, or at least pattern where there's really nothing in the fossil record. And then in the Cambrian, we have this sudden appearance, uh, which looks like an explosion of a high diversity and disparity of different uh, complex animal body plans. But what's going on right before that is this really interesting and uh, bizarre and frustrating to some extent because of the limitations of the information known as the Ediacaran uh, biota. So these are uh, multicellular uh, complex organisms, uh, but we really, uh, phylogenetically, it's not really clear what they are. Uh, what I'm showing you here is the time period, the geologic time period. So here's the Cambrian, the start of the Phanerozoic. Here is the last uh, period, part of the Precambrian, that is the Ediacaran period, which goes from about 500, or I'm sorry, 635 to 541 million years ago. And what, what I'm showing you here are different elements of this biota that uh, in gray is marking uh, different, um, uh, I believe, formations or assemblages through time. And the bars here with the dots indicate the presence of these different uh, Ediacaran biota uh, species or lineages. So it's not clear uh, what the, how these uh, organisms um, lived. Uh, it's thought that they are not autotrophs, that they were heterotrophs, meaning that they're not primary um, producers, but they were consumers. And what I'm showing you down here on the right, so uh, I'm sorry, down here on the right is just uh, from a recent paper showing photographs of what some of these fossils look like. The top here is a reconstruction of a uh, uh, near shore marine ecosystem during the Ediacaran period. And we actually uh, see organisms that uh, 
are actually animals in this representation. Now, phylogenetically, um, the Ediacaran fauna has been proposed to be a major clade called the Vendo Fianta. And uh, that is even, that is debated. It's debated whether the Ediacaran fauna is a monophyletic group or not. But what I think is important is, uh, well, are the different phylogenetic resolutions of elements of the Ediacaran fauna. And it's, I think, um, easiest to approach here for the purposes of our course to think of it as a group, the Vendo Bianta, right? So in one, some representations, we have the Vendo Bianta, always here in, in orange, as a sister essentially to a group that uh, contains the dinoflagellates, uh, so unicellular eukaryotic lineage. Uh, another represent, uh, phylogenetic resolution essentially has them sister to the metazoans, uh, all the animals. Uh, and then another representation actually has the, the Ediacaran fauna as phylogenetically nested within animals. That is, periphera are the sponges. All other animals have been classified as eumetazoa. But as we're going to learn in uh, the next couple lectures, that uh, it's not clear that sponges are the sister lineage to all other animals. The point here is that the Ediacaran fauna uh, is clearly uh, multicellular, uh, larger in size multicellular organisms, and where they fit into the tree of life is not clear. Okay, so in this lecture, you should be able to think about uh, the diversity of metabolic systems in bacteria and archaea. Really think about where was photosynthesis invented and its consequences for oxygen, particularly the ox presence of oxygen in Earth's oceans and atmosphere. You should think about the origin of the eukaryotic cell, the origin of the nucleus, origin of mitochondria and chloroplasts by uh, endosymbiosis. You should think about oxygen, greenhouse gases, and snowball Earth events, and then uh, the onset and early history of multicellularity in the history of life. So until, uh, until next time, uh, be well, be safe.